Steam Pour is a channel created out of curiosity. Curiosity for a deeper knowledge of the vast, wonderful world of tea and coffee. For years, it has fascinated me that tea is not just a drink, but so much more. There are hundreds of different kinds of tea, each with its own unique history, uses, benefits, and flavor notes. Sometimes even entire ceremonies are designed around tea, imbuing it with meaning and emphasizing the importance of fully immersing oneself in the pure enjoyment of tea. My natural curiosity to know more about tea and what it can do leads me to the world of science in an attempt to get to know tea on even the smallest molecular level. Considering the fact that currently my sense of smell is a little off due to recent sickness, I decided to put the planned Earl Grey episode on hold until I can enjoy it with all of my senses, so that I can give you, the subscriber, the full experience. If it is a tea party you're craving, go check out Steam Pour's most recent video about London Fog. This time on Steam Pour, we're going to get down to the science of why certain teas call for steeping times of 10 or more minutes, and others require only 3 minutes. Or why some teas like to be scalded in boiling water, and others are more delicate, requiring gently heated water. This is the perfect time to ready your best notebook in freshly sharpened pencil, and don the optional lab coat as we explore the oxidation, nutrient content, and breakdown of those nutrients in black tea, green tea, oolong, and more. Let's start off with a quick crash course about the differences in types of tea. In the traditional sense of the word, all tea comes from a plant called Camellia sinensis, with the exception of herbal teas. Herbal teas come from roots, herbs, tree bark, and flowers such as linden blossom or cinnamon. You may have heard of white tea, green tea, yellow tea, oolong tea, red tea, and black tea. If they all come from the same plant, what makes one type of tea taste so different from another? The magic comes in the way the tea is processed, specifically in how long the leaves are allowed to oxidize and how much rolling or maceration they go through. The tea leaves are rolled to break their cell walls, thereby allowing more oxygen to permeate into the plant cells for more thorough oxidation. All organic matter oxidizes, even your own cells. It's just the way life progresses. In fact, the oxidation of your cells is a big contributing factor to aging. That's why antioxidants are so good for you. We'll discuss more on that later, but for now, exactly how big a role does oxidation play in the science of tea leaves? Oxidation is the reason a flower stays fresh as long as it's growing in the ground, but will wilt in a few days or even hours after you pluck it. It's the reason bananas begin to show brown spots over time, and why apples begin to brown just minutes after being cut. It's the same with tea leaves. Once the leaves of the Camellia sinensis plant are picked, it's only a matter of time before they begin to oxidize, and not long after that, they reach peak oxidation. The different types of tea take on flavor profiles and antioxidant levels based on how long the leaves are left to wilt after being picked. Red tea can be confusing. It's often equated with rooibos tea, however this is not the same as the true definition of red tea. Rooibos is a tea made from a plant of the same name. So what is true red tea? Surprisingly, it's what we in many Western countries incorrectly refer to as black tea. Think of Lipton tea or English breakfast tea. These have come to be marketed as black tea, but are technically red tea, not black tea. You see, in the east, tea is named for the color of the brew, while in the west, it's named after the color of the leaf after processing. Okay, well then what is black tea? Black tea is actually very dark in color, and is when the leaves of the Camellia sinensis plant are fully oxidized, and then literally fermented and aged using microbial cultures. Puer tea is a good example of this. Note that oxidation and fermentation are not the same thing. Oxidation is when the leaves wilt as we discussed, and fermentation is when a culture is introduced. 
Both oxidation and rolling of the leaves are meant to expose the natural chemicals contained in the leaves. This happens in different amounts depending on level of oxidation and amount of crushing, which is why green tea tastes different from yellow tea, which tastes different from white. These chemicals that are released are healthy compounds such as polyphenols, antioxidants, and caffeine. Tea leaves also contain compounds which are responsible for smell, such as geraniol and phenylacetaldehyde, and compounds responsible for flavor such as linalool and tannins. For now, let's focus on the wellness side of tea leaves, the polyphenols and antioxidants. Why are polyphenols and antioxidants so good for you? Think of polyphenols as defense and antioxidants as offense. Polyphenols are responsible for lowering blood sugar and fighting inflammation, two things that contribute to a number of diseases in the body, such as diabetes and cancer. They help to protect and fortify so that you can more easily prevent and avoid cell damage in the first place. In addition, polyphenols are great at promoting brain function, such as boosting focus and memory. And antioxidants are the soldiers that actively fight against free radicals in your body. Free radicals are unstable molecules that damage your cells and DNA. They're produced whenever your body fights anything undesirable and can be exacerbated by things like pollution, processed foods, and ultraviolet radiation. According to Harvard's health department, because free radicals lack a full complement of electrons, they steal electrons from other molecules and damage those molecules in the process. Antioxidants neutralize free radicals by giving up some of their own electrons. In making this sacrifice, they act as a natural off switch for the free radicals. Knowing that, how wonderful is it that we have something like tea that both protects and fights for us against all the environmental dangers this world imposes on our bodies? So, to get back to the science of steeping, let's look at the best way to get all these wonderful nutrients out of the leaf and into our bodies. Steeping is just another word for the more scientific term of what goes on in a leaf when it hits hot water, osmotic diffusion. You may recognize the root word osmosis in there. When a leaf or herb, somewhat crushed to exposed what's inside, sits in water long enough, the nutrients inside basically exchange places with the water outside, continuing over a number of minutes until the concentration of nutrients is at equilibrium across both the leaf and the water. This is osmotic diffusion. The water is now full of everything that was formerly contained in the tea leaf, and so water has become tea. During steeping, the nutrients emerge into the water at different times based on molecular weight. To best describe this, let's imagine those nutrients sliding into the water on a water slide. And for illustration's sake, let's represent those nutrients as animals of different weights, because who doesn't love cute animals on water slides? The tea leaf will send out its lightest weight nutrients first, the ones responsible for smell and flavor. These are followed by the middleweight nutrients, the healthy antioxidants, and caffeine. And as more time progresses, the heaviest nutrients are sent out. These would be the polyphenols, amino acids, and tannins. That's why you can stop steeping early for flavor and later for caffeine. And if you go too long, tannins will make it taste bitter. Here are the recommended steeping times for different types of tea. Another important factor in the most optimal tea brew is the temperature of the water. Higher water temp means higher kinetic energy and will more quickly extract the nutritive compounds. So, why do some teas like black tea need boiling hot water and other teas like green tea caution against using water that's too hot? Simple, less oxidized teas need water that is less hot so they don't get damaged or overheated. If you use boiling water on these teas, you'll destroy those more delicate lightweight compounds responsible for flavor and your green or white tea would end up bitter. See if those flavor chemicals enter the water sooner because of their lighter molecular weight as we discussed, and hot water increases kinetic energy, then the lighter compounds will exit the leaf much faster than the heavier compounds, therefore causing the flavor to not be at its best. Here are recommended water temperatures for the different types of tea. Isn't tea amazing? I regard it as a God-given gift. 
This one plant, Camellia sinensis, can produce so many types of tea based on the myriad ways it could be processed. Now that we've taken an in-depth look at exactly how oxidation, diffusion, and water temperature can impact the taste, you can more deeply understand your next cup of tea and everyone thereafter. Now you know exactly what it takes to really make the most optimal, mindfully brewed cup of tea that you can. After all, it's just as important to know the why as well as the what, so that if you ever wonder how long to leave your leaves steeping or what temperature of water to use, you'll be able to use your newfound knowledge to deduce the answer yourself. I hope today's video has been informative and cleared up some misconceptions about brewing tea. I used to think that if I wanted stronger tasting tea, I just needed to leave it in the water for longer. Now I see that that reasoning is silly. If I crave an extra strong cup of tea in terms of flavor, I'll just use two tea bags instead of one without changing the amount of water in the cup because I now know how osmotic diffusion works. I would keep the temperature and steeping time the same according to whether I'm steeping black tea leaves, red, or oolong. Thanks for watching until the end of the video. Hopefully you find the inner workings of tea as fascinating as I do. I'll see you in the next video where hopefully my sense of smell will be restored enough to brew up some delicious Earl Grey. In the meantime, I'd really appreciate a thumbs up on this video if you liked it. Bye for now!